All right. Seeing none, and without objection, this item will be reviewed. That takes us to Department of Corrections. Senator Flippo, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members, before I make this motion, I just want to give a brief, brief back, background on why. So the, uh, this contract was changed in the portal a few days ago, and because there was some material changes to the contract, uh, we do need a motion to suspend the rules. So with that, I move to suspend the rules to consider the new contract documents we received today related to the Board of Corrections outside council contract. All right, members, you've heard a motion. And, and then we have some handouts from staff, I believe, as well, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Senator Flippo, would you explain your motion one more time to be clear? Okay, so there was some there were some changes to this contract made in the portal, I believe, last week, and so because there were some changes to that, we do need to suspend the rules because there's a new contract that we are going to hand out to members. So just to be within the letter of the law and our, the the rules of this committee, uh, I am going to make a motion that we do suspend the rules to consider the new contract documents we received today related to the Board of Corrections outside council contract. All right, members, we have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? All right, the ayes have it. The rules are suspended. Uh, go ahead. And then. Senator Gilmore, you recognize? Well, I had a discussion on that motion, which I'm, I'm fine. I'm glad we went ahead and, and suspended the rules to bring that up. I was just going to ask what was the reason for the amendment, I guess, or adding this, these new documents to the portal. Maybe the senator was going to answer those that question. I'm not sure. Thank you, Senator Gilmore. I think there's sees a, um, Chad Brown, Secretary Wallace, and some of the board members here. So I think you know, it's appropriate time. The chair will probably call them to the table, and they can probably answer that better than I can. But, and that's fine. And, and again, it was more for discussion before sure. the motion. But, uh, but yeah, that's fine. And I apologize. I jumped the gun a little too quick. Uh, Representative Kavanaugh, you're recognized. Uh, yes, my question is, I have some questions for the commission, so. All right, we can get someone up from the Department of Corrections or the Board of Corrections or both. Or all three. All right, gentlemen, if you wouldn't introduce yourself for the record, we'll get to the question. Dubs Byers, uh, member of the Board of Correction. Benny Magnus, member of the Board of Corrections. Uh, Wade Hodge, Chief of Staff. Chad Brown, Chief Financial Officer, Department of Corrections. All right, thank you. And Senator Gilmore, I believe Kathy can give you a little information as to why the contract was changed, if you'd like that at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, just to clarify things, the contract that you see on the agenda on page 27 notes that this was done as an RFQ for $200,000. In a meeting earlier today, it was noted by the Office of State Procurement something about an emergency exempt by law contract at $207,000. So after further looking at it, we determined that a different contract had been added to the portal that the Bureau was not made aware of. And so that is what was pulled and is being made available to you all today. So we're substituting or providing you all with this, uh, this contract information that was provided to us after the meeting. All right, Senator Gilmore, you're recognized. Thank you, and just follow up for clar clarification. So as I understand, this, this contract is to replace what I think had already been previously submitted to procurement? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right, Representative Kavanaugh, you recognized for a question? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is actually going to be for the board, so I have several questions, actually. Um, one question is, how do you go back and ask for an RFQ when you've already entered into a contract? 
Representative Kavanaugh, let me, let me answer that question. When we put this contract into the portal, it would not let us submit the full contract into the portal without selecting an RFQ, RFP. The RFQ, the reason we put that on the contract is because that was the method that should have been used, and that was the only way we could get it into the portal for you guys to review. But wait, had you not already signed a contract? Well, Representative, that's the reason we're coming to to seek ratification is to go back and ratify this contract back to December 8th when the board got into a contract with the council. Okay, that's gonna lead that's gonna lead very nicely into my other questions. Actually, procurement law actually states that to procure services and establish the payment due under the contract will need to meet or exceed $75,000. It is required generally to solicit competitive sealed bids or comp competitive sealed proposals. Did that happen in this case? No, ma'am, that did not. Okay. My next question it is, um, when a state agency or department needs the services of an attorney, the process begins with the agency notifying the attorney general, who is by law the attorney for all state agencies. Did that happen? And then, um, if in the opinion of the Attorney General, it is necessary to employ special counsel to the, prosecute a lawsuit on behalf of the state or defend a suit brought against the state agency, with the approval of the governor, the special counsel can be employed, but compensated is fixed by the court with the written approval of the governor and the Attorney General. Did that happen? No, ma'am, it did not. Okay. Representative Kavanaugh, can you hang on just one second. Mr. Magnus, I didn't hear your response to the previous question. Uh, it, Would you, the, the it previous not, question? It did not happen. Uh, we, no. the Board of Corrections felt like that there was an impossibility to get an unbiased ruling. Okay. I, I just asked you a yes or no question, Mr. Okay. Magnus. Okay. My question mm -hmm. is, if a state agency needs the service of an attorney and the attorney general fails to render the service when requested in writing, then upon the establishment of the fact, the governor may appoint counsel to look after the matter or authorize the agency to employ counsel. Did that happen? No, ma'am. Okay. So our procurement law that you're supposed to follow, you did not follow that into this contract. You entered into a contract with someone. You ask us now to ratify it, and you entered in a new contract at the last hour. I feel like that there's lots of issues from time to time where agencies didn't follow procurement law exactly, and we did not feel, uh, follow procurement law exactly till we were aware of it. But no, ma'am, we, we did not uh, follow procurement law. The lawsuit that was filed, the judge ruled that we were entitled to, um, to representation and that uh, Attorney General Griffin could not represent us because of his bias. So, yes, when we felt like that there was a, a reason to go and research or follow procurement law, the board asked Mr. Brown our chief finance services to contact Mr. Armstrong and see what we need to do to continue to follow procurement law. But you did not do it through the sealed process that you're no. required to in procurement law? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Representative Kavanaugh. Senator Hester, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Magnus. Um, you know, the Attorney General uh, is accountable every time there's an election to the people of Arkansas legislature is accountable to the people of Arkansas. We're held accountable through the balance of powers to the judiciary and the executive branch. The executive is held accountable on election day and to the people of Arkansas and judiciary is held accountable on election day. Who are you accountable to and how are you held accountable? We're accountable to this Who? legislature and the people of Arkansas and the governor of state of Arkansas. So you, we don't feel like we're accountable necessarily to uh, the AG's office, they are supposed to be an unbiased uh, par, uh, agency that would represent us and do represent us in other cases. Um, I don't think there's 
other than the procurement law, there's no question that we could not fit, get a unbiased decision from the uh, AG's office. You have to be where we were at when, uh, for example, when the board decided to terminate Mr. Perfia, then Mr. Perfia refused to leave work and refused to follow our directions to give us more time to, it wasn't just about. So I, th the, I think the question but, was how, you just said that you're accountable to the legislature. How do we hold you accountable? You're, you're holding us accountable here today. You're holding us accountable that we made an error in the procurement law. And I, I've been here before, I've watched stuff before. It's not unusual for an agency to, to make a mistake during the procurement laws. So the Board and, of Corrections is, is accountable and responsible for the laws that this legislature passes and honoring them? If they're not unconstitutional, or, yes. If they're not unconstitutional? Yes. And that, okay. that, um, that's where the separation of powers become important to all of us uh, citizens of the state of Arkansas, that we have the opportunity to take that to a uh, higher authority, you might say. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, Mr. Brown, uh, well, I, I'll ask you one more question. Um, are, is, is the board, are you guys procurement specialists? You do this routinely, and, and there's, uh, according to you, there's really there's no one above you. You don't, you don't answer to anybody. So who are you procurement specialists? We're not procurement uh, specialists. We before do before you before you took on a contract that's going to run a million dollars a year for legal services, which is you know five times the cost of any lawyer that the state of Arkansas hires. Did you consult anyone with how to spend approximately a million dollars a year, or that's what you're on pace to spend? Yeah, no, sir. We we didn't uh, years ago, and I don't know how many years ago the board uh, was in a similar situation, and we hired outside counsel. It's not the first time we've hired outside counsel. I don't remember us going through the procurement law at that time to hire that outside counsel, uh, but we did recently. We've had, and I say recently, about two years ago, we did have to hire outside counsel. I'm sure the attorney general's office was involved in that because the, um, the person that was suing us is, was in California. Well, it's not often that an unelected, unaccountable board member sues the people of Arkansas with their own money. But, Mr. Brown... Um, can you tell me, were you consulted on how to, uh, on the procurement process? No, sir, I was not. And so it was just dumped in your lap and said, figure out a way to pay this? Well, the board went into executive session in one of their board meetings and they came out and made a motion to hire counsel. And that's, that's how the process went. Okay, thank you. I'm finished for now. All right, thank you, Senator. Senator Gilmore, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just want to pick up right where um, Senator Hester left off. Mr. Brown, uh, you mentioned going into executive session with the board and they basically said, pay this, right? Um, were you by chance called into that executive session and was there a discussion about the payment of this? No, Senator, I was not called into that executive session. Okay. Were, did you have any discussions with the board outside of um, normal process and a board meeting or in an executive session regarding this? I was called into an executive session in a later board meeting, uh, and that discussion was based on which outside legal counsel I had been discussing uh, this issue with, and that was Chief Counsel Mr. Wade Hodge. Okay, I so referred to them in the executive session. So you, you were called in executive discuss, executive session to discuss this. Correct. Okay, so uh, did you did you advise the board um, of the process of how to legally procure this? process moved at a pretty quick pace once I realized that we violated procurement law I brought that to Chairman Magnus's attention uh, and also gave him recommendations on how to fix uh, the situation that we're in which is why we're before you today and what was your advice my advice was to bring this before this body to ratify the contract and, and do it correctly okay Mr. Magnus, if, if I may direct, or to the other board member, Mr. Byers, if I may direct the next couple of questions. If I may have some latitude, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Do you believe that contracts for, for these types of services should go through the normal procurement process? Uh, You'll have to turn off one of those mics to get Sorry. yours on. 
Uh, Senator Gilmore, I, uh, I have to say that I am not an expert on this. I'm an elementary school teacher, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not an expert. Understood. It's a complicated process yes, to be sure. Yes, it is. And what was your restate your question, please? Were you aware of the of a process to procure a contract such as this for legal services? Not in this case, no. Okay, so you weren't aware, Mr. Magnus. Were you? I was not. As I said, we had uh, had hard outside cancel many years ago. I don't even remember what it was for, and we did not go through the peculiar process that I can remember back mm -hmm. then. Do you, do you remember making any sort of statement in a, in a board meeting? And I understand that, uh, you know, we've all slept since then, clearly. But do you remember making some sort of statement in a board meeting that said to the effect of, we just didn't have time to go through that process regarding this particular procurement? Well, I think I'll, I stated it a while ago, in fact, uh, that if I'd have known there was a process there, I would have been glad to went through it because uh, I don't, I want to follow the procurement law, but uh, at the time I didn't know about it. And y yes, we didn't feel like we had we, we needed to act quickly. Like uh, I was saying, Mr. Fia was determined to continue to work after the board voted to terminate him. So um, if, if I said that, it was no disrespect to this body or to anyone other than, yes, we did feel like time was the essence that we needed some legal representation. Okay. So to that end, and I, I think this will be my final question for the time, and I'm understanding, of, you know, there's other members that have questions, so I want to be fair in that regard. And I appreciate you gentlemen being here to answer questions. So to that end, to your point of needing counsel, um, when was the first time, do you recall, uh, the board or anyone with BOC or, or DOC for that matter, so the Board of Corrections or Department of Corrections, reaching out to the attorney at question here um, for counsel uh, and potentially representing the board in these matters? Sir, I couldn't tell you the exact date or when we determined we might need legal representation. There were several conversations throughout the more than a year with Mr. Profia that he was um, not serving the, the Board of Corrections wishes or concerns. Yeah. Uh, and I just would point out that Mr. Profiri is not on question here today. I understand. You asked me when we decided. I understand. And it could have been in any kind of, of, uh, of the latter conversations about our secretary um, that that subject came up. And where did those conversations take place? It would have been in uh, a board meeting or at executive session. Okay, so you were having those discussions in executive session with, with the lawyer question? Did we have the, about hiring a lawyer in executive session? Did you have those discussions about Mr. Profiri in executive session with the lawyer at question? Yes. Okay. No, the lawyer wasn't there. That's, I mean, you're, are you asking me that we, did we have uh, conversations about, did you have Mr., if about you, the secretary and at the same time a possibly uh, hiring an attorney? And or both, yes. Yes. Okay. That answers the question. All right, Senator Gilmore, thank you. Representative Wardlaw, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I hope I can get this out. Um, <clears throat> having trouble with my voice this week. Mr. Brown, you said you had to put this in as an RFP or an RFQ to get it submitted. When you do that, you're saying that you completed an RFQ. Did that get completed? No, sir, an RFQ was not completed. We tried to type in NA in that category on the document, but the portal would not accept the document. Did you... Um, did you try to get assistance from procurement? I believe we reached out to state procurement, yes, sir. What was what was their advice? Well, state procurement, they have to have something in the portal to send over to the Bureau so the Bureau can pull it off for you guys to review. My problem with this is, is when it's presented to the legislature, it looks like you did an RFQ, which would have been following procurement law. 
you didn't follow procurement law, you didn't get an RFQ, but you submitted it to us and it says on the paper right here, RFQ. That's, that's an issue to me. I understand that you're here for ratification and fix it. Mr. Chair, I'll get back in the queue, but I'm really worried about that. Thank you, Representative Wardlaw. Uh, let's see here. We have a seat 90, Senator Stone. You're recognized. Yes, Mr. Magnus. I just want to ask a uh, question for clarification. Did I understand, uh, understand you to say that you went into executive session to discuss hiring outside counsel? That wasn't the reason for the session, no. The reason was to con talk to continually about the unresponsiveness and the work performance of the secretary. Well, you know, if you went in there for uh, to discuss the secretary when those discussions ended, why didn't you break your executive session to come back out and discuss uh, the, con uh, the discuss the hiring of an outside contractor in in uh, in, in in your regular session or, or or in your regular meeting? Why did you hold that? Continue to have those conversations behind closed doors. I was asked the question if an attorney had ever been mentioned during executive session, and the. Uh, the remark was made, we may, may need to eventually hire an attorney. That's all that was said in executive session. I answered the question for Mr. Gilmore, Senator Gilmore a while ago, truthfully. A remark was made about an attorney, but no discussion about who to hire or when to hire. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Senator. Senator Dismang, you're recognized. Yeah, and I think that leads into really what I was going to ask. So how did that come about? So there was no request for a, pro, you know, for a proposal, no RFQ. And then how did the contract with this current attorney come about? I mean, someone reached out to someone. Did he slitch his job because of reading the paper? Was it a friend of somebody that's on the board and they just knew knew him because of the relationship? Like, but how where did where did he come from? How did the how did the firm come about? Because or is there somewhere in the board minutes you could point to that that was decided and someone can explain there had to be a rationale to why this particular individual. Yes, uh, board or member company. Mr. Uh, Lee Watson is a contract and uh, employment attorney, and he's the one that, uh, on his own, talked to uh, the attorney firm. He had talked to a couple of them because of that one remark in a board meeting, and then he came back with a recommendation eventually. Because of the remark, y'all asked him then to essentially uh, find an attorney in the executive not, session? Not in that uh, executive session. I may have asked him as a chairman uh, to explore some options. Okay, but that but happened in the board meeting. never talked at the, at, in the executive session. Uh, as my memory correct me, I have another board member that was in executive session. You'd be welcome to, uh, to ask him. But uh, never in that executive session did we talk about uh, Mr. Watson find an attorney or which attorney or anything like that. Just that we, uh, one of the end of the conversations about Secretary of uh, Corrections that we made at some point need to get an attorney. We had had Mr. Uh, our attorney, our compliance attorney in at one point at a board meeting and executive session, again talking to him about um, the performance of Mr. the Secretary. So, but I'm... legal representation, and then how did y'all approve this particular attorney just based on his own recommendation Recommendation only? No other research, no other, you know, resumes or history or whatever it may be. Just Mr. Watson brought y'all a recommendation. You said that's the one we're going to do it. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Beatty, you're recognized. 
just a, a couple of questions. Uh, one, reviewing the documents that were submitted, looking at the dates and tracking these. It, um, primarily, I see an engagement letter that were signed by um, Mr. Um, Byers and uh, Chairman Magnus on December 23rd of, of 23, uh, which um, actually in I guess we would all look like that, that that's actually a contract that you entered to, into at that time on December 23rd. Um, who did the um, verified complaint and filed that complaint back on December 14th? Was it the same attorney that filed, that, that you signed an engagement letter with on the 23rd? Yes, it was. Okay. Um, my, my second question is, how long have you been in your position and, and a member of the Board of Corrections? 25 years, I think. In that 25 years, who's advised you on procurement and, and the way the, the department and, and that agency operates? Well, in the past, before uh, transformation, each agency had its own um, procurement or um, and financial person. So we look towards those people to keep us out of the ditches, per se, and uh, th then it's not that it's anything r wrong with transformation and having one financial officer, but we have went through a, uh, a change in that procurement. Mr. Brown had not, what date, Mr. Brown, was you taking over as uh, chief financial? About six or seven months ago. Six or seven months ago. We had had some changes in that position. So... Um, that's how I would answer the question. We always required on the financial people to keep us out of the ditches. This was just a um, very much different situation, difficult situation to work with. A follow-up with Mr. Brown. Mr. Brown, specifically, what did you advise um, Chairman Magnus and the board uh, involving this contract? Because it looks like the discussion started on December 8th at a board meeting and, and, and quickly... Um, went from December 8th to an attorney doing work for you on the 14th without any written agreement or an engagement letter, and then an engagement letter, letter coming on the 23rd, uh, followed by a hearing on the 4th of January, and then a preliminary injunction on the 19th, up till, I guess, 3-6, when suddenly we're going to put everything in a proper contract and submit that back and try now to follow the procurement rules of the state and present that to the committee today. So what did you specifically instruct your board and the folks that, that, that you're serving there in your position regarding this contract? Well, Representative, I had many conversations with many people to try to figure out. I'm only if, concerned about the board, sir. Okay. To, to figure out if we did violate procurement law. Uh, when I realized, in my opinion, I thought we violated procurement law, I told Chairman Magnus and the board we had three options. Or maybe two, I've got my memo. One option is to let the council seek uh, his payment through the claims commission, or we can come and ratify this contract and try to fix the situation we're in, or we don't pay him at all. And, and their response back to that, which option they prefer? Chairman Magnus says, get him paid and do it correctly, which brings us before you today. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Beatty. Mr. Brown, I have a question. On the original, I guess, contract that we saw, you had it listed as an RFQ, and I think you mentioned a minute ago that was the only choice you had to select or something of that nature. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That was just to enter it into the portal for you guys, for Ms. Schmidt to pull it off of and put it on your agenda. You can't ratify just a letter by itself. So when so I submitted my letter, I had to have something that accompanied that. But the new one says emergency slash exempt from law. If I'm reading this correctly, and I believe that I am, what does that mean? Emergency exempt from law as far as the procurement method? Now that I don't know. I know we put RFQ on it. And that's all I know. So you mentioned earlier that RFQ really wasn't what you wanted to select. You wanted to select NA? That's correct. Because it, we didn't are you saying the there's no, there was no good choice for you as far as this contract is concerned? No, sir. Not based on the situation that we were in. 
because we didn't go through a process, but we had to select a process that was given to us, even though all of them were incorrect. But you selected the process after you'd already entered the contract? Well, that process had to be selected when we entered it. But you don't know what this means, emergency exempt from law, and this one is? I do not. This Can anybody answer, can anybody tell me what that means, emergency exempt from law? No. Armstrong, you would introduce yourself, just for the record. I'm Edward Armstrong, State Procurement Director, and my apologies. I was getting stereoscopic questions back there from the department <laughs> at the same time that your question came across. Would you mind repeating the question for me? My question is, um, I'm just trying to follow what Mr. Brown said. He looked for, um, I'm here right in front of you, up here, no. RFQ, but he wanted to select NA, which means not applicable, I guess. And now we have this substitute contract that says emergency exempt from law as the excuse me the procurement method. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand where that is. That a selection that you can make on the software? Or? So uh, the portal has certain predetermined options. We try to limit them to the options that are recognized under the law. Because if it's a free form text field, people could write whatever in there and we would get all kinds of methods of procurement as people would write whatever. Uh, and so I think what occurred is that they were selecting a method and somebody, and putting it into the portal at the department, selected RFQ because that is one of the viable options. NA is not one of the options you can select from the menu. And then exempt by law is an option, but it's not typical. I, we've never had an exempt by law that I'm aware of that's been presented for review and if you look at the item, which I only recently saw today and wanted to make sure it was brought to everybody's attention because it is materially different from the first document that was entered. Uh, and that is, and that's why, too, I don't have a, in the letter to uh, this committee, I talk about the different contracts. This contract, or this item, I'll say, didn't have a contract number assigned to it because I only had a letter from Mr. Brown. There was no document at that time. Uh, so I refer to it as a purported contract because I hadn't seen any contract documents. And then in order to populate the summary, something had to be submitted. So we got a deadline from Kathy Schmidt. Something was submitted. But then apparently on the 6th, somebody at the department submitted this substitute document, which was signed. And it also has, if you look at number two, I want to make sure everybody reads that carefully because I've never seen this before. Uh, in the objective scopes and performance uh, of this document, it, it says, essentially, I'll summarize it, we are exempt from procurement law. We think we're exempt, and we are also going to uh, submit this, however, in good faith so that we can uh, facilitate the payment of the contractor's outstanding and prospective invoices. And then they also propose a method for themselves in the future of how their bills will get paid. Later on in Section 5, they want us to incorporate a court order of Judge Patricia James uh, by reference. And then uh, this document goes on to modify one of our non-negotiable terms. In number 9, we make it really clear in our standard contract that nothing in our contract should be construed to waive or call into question sovereign immunity, the sovereign immunity of the state. This one has been modified to say um, that nothing in this contract shall be construed as a waiver of the state's sovereign immunity if applicable. And then later on says any claims that the contractor wishes to assert against the state in connection with this contract shall be brought in the Arkansas State Claims Commission if applicable. Well, for us, there's no question that the proper form for litigating contracts is the State Claims Commission. 
uh, this introduces a question as to whether or not that's applicable, uh, which is not something that we would um, we would tolerate if, if we were entering into a contract for the state. And so I wanted to, okay. those I thought were material changes and I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of them. Have you ever seen that procurement method used before, the exempt from law procurement method? Well, yes, because there are various exemptions in the procurement law. And you typically don't see them because if, if a constitutional right. officer, for example, is exempt, they don't have to submit those contracts for review. In uh, order going to back to the software, though, is that, a, is that a selection that someone can make exempt from law? I don't know. I suspect it is because okay. it is in ACES they can select exempt from law when they are creating an outline agreement or a PO. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. Um, Speaker Shepard, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Dismain covered some of the questions that I originally had, but then uh, now with this document in front of me and some of the uh, questions have been asked, I have some additional questions. Uh, I guess to Mr. Armstrong, in light of your last comment and this document, the purported services contract that was recently provided, uh, is it my understanding that had, had this been provided in, well in advance and the opportunity to review uh, in advance of this meeting been provided, this probably would have been rejected and would not have even made it to this point. It's hard to guess what we would have done, but uh, I definitely would have asked a question about it, and it probably would have halted the process while I uh, spoke uh, to whoever was responsible for that change, and I would have told them that our position is that there is no question as to whether or not the sovereign immunity of the state is applicable. Uh, we think it is. Then the second question I have, since much of this goes back to the end of last year and uh, we've discussed and there's been testimony about the need for outside counsel, I'd like to know what communication, what direct communication there was between uh, the board and the attorney general's office at the outset and what steps the board took to determine whether there was an irre irreconcilable conflict between the AG's office and the Board of Corrections. Um, I feel like the, uh, the press conference where the AG got up there and called the board and myself a failure, failure, failure was enough for me to understand I needed an unbiased representation for the board. Um, Judge Fox, in his ruling, gave the AG 30 days to make contact with myself or a board member to try to work this out. I did not hear from the AG for 30 days during that time period, so ordered by Judge Fox. Um, Judge James I realize this is somewhat after the fact, but in her ruling, she said it was a constitutional board, therefore constitutional members, and we had, under Statute 711, we could hire outside counsel. We're here because we're trying to do, once we found out we needed to do something different, we're here because of that. What, well, it, and actually, I think the services agreement actually talks about why we're here. The This... This document that was recently completed and provided, in, in my view, is somewhat alarming because it basically states that the point of this is to facilitate payment. And I've, I don't know that I've, that I've ever seen something brought to us to say to facilitate payment. It's basically, it's what, what it sounds like today is whatever it takes to get the attorney paid, that's what y'all want to do. And I, how much, have, how much uh, have, has the board incurred in legal fees to this point? Speaker, over three months, we are up to $135,639. That's the total to date? Yes, sir. Has anything been paid? No, sir. And then... Uh, I thought the number, I thought we'd seen another number uh, with some additional fees. I thought it was upwards of 200000 Is that not where we're at now? No, sir. I've got the three invoices in front of me. 
December was $51,706, January was $71,552, and February was $12,381. And then the final question I have, and it, it goes back to something that Senator Dismang asked about, is what steps were taken to, uh, to inquire as to other law firms or attorneys, and was there any negotiation re related to the legal expenses? And then along with that, what was the expectation? Did the attorney provide an expectation of what the expenses would run to represent them, represent the board in this matter? Could you ask the question again? First question, uh, what other firms were contacted and what discussions took place? There was no other firms contacted and, uh, well, hold on a minute. I don't, if Mr. Watson contacted another firm, I don't know that. All I know is, uh, I know he contacted this firm, and this is the only firm I had conversations with. And then the, the follow-up question was, what is the expectation as to uh, the amount of fees that will be incurred in this representation? Um, we've, are you asking for the end result? Well, I just know, I mean, as you know, I'm a practicing attorney, and usually my clients want to know uh, what do I think it's going to cost to represent. Now, if you, I guess if you can find a client that uh, is willing to write a blank check, that's the best kind of client to have. But was there any kind of expectation as to what the cost would be, what the board could expect, I mean, this, these are funds of the st a state of Arkansas that, you, that the board is asking for the ability to pay attorneys. And so what, what's the expectation here? It's my understanding that to take it to, all the way to the uh, Supreme Court and have a ruling, it would be no more than $200,000. Thank you. All right, Senator Dismang, you're recognized. My question, just to circle back, because it sounded like we just stumbled upon something that was not seen even before just a few minutes ago, and that's the question of sovereign immunity and the fact that it was waived in this newest version that was uploaded, and I don't, from what I understood, was not in the previous version that was uploaded. Who advised the change to waive that in this newest contract that came forward? I, one of y'all are going to have to turn off the mic. Senator, I'll have to go back and figure that out. The staff that I talked to said they did not put that in there, so I'm not sure where that came from at this moment. In time. Well, but that, that's, you couldn't have not put it in there intentionally. It doesn't pre-format that way when you're filling it out. So someone intentionally changed that. Was the attorney advising on the submission of his own proposal? Not to my knowledge, he wasn't. Not well, with anybody in my office. I, I am perplexed on how that could possibly be changed. There's only very few people that that would benefit. That change would benefit. And it is not the people of Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I, like, I'd almost demand before we do much more to know who made that change and why, who would be willing to put Arkansas in that position. I mean, that, that's careless and reckless, and I would hope as board members you're going to be demanding action for whoever made that call because that's, that's not insignificant. And then we're sitting here blindly being asked to approve a contract that was resubmitted within the last, how long? Uh, several days that would have essentially waived the rights of the state. I'm sure we can find an answer to who put that in that. Uh, I don't have an answer for you since I didn't... How, how is that possible? Uh, how does no one know who uploaded the most recent and made changes that had to be intentionally made? I, I really am dumbfounded in the response. Senator, I mean, the, only, the only change that I know of that was made was the, the first contract that we submitted did not have signatures on it. The second one had signatures on it. I don't know of any other changes that were made to that document when it was entered. Well, maybe we'll find out that it was originally submitted with the waiving of sovereign immunity, and maybe we didn't catch it the first round. I don't know. It was not. I, I will find out. Check. Okay, so the, the the change wasn't just, yeah, I mean, I, 
that's a big deal. <laughs> and so, and I don't think we need to you know, understate how big of a deal that was. And whoever did that you know, exposed a lot of risk. And y'all sitting down here in, in wanting to pursue this exposes the state of Arkansas to a lot of risk. I am shocked that you wouldn't withdraw at this very moment and move on. That would be my advice. All right, thank you, Senator Dismang. Senator Dees, you're up next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is for Mr. Bagnus, Chairman of the Board. With accountability to the legislature, I appreciate you coming today. I'm going to make sure what I heard correct, that at least three times we broke the law, procurement law, and I thought I heard through the testimony that it was because of fear of bias of someone against you who called you failure, failure, failure. And so you decided to make decisions on contracts only with the people that agree with you instead of following the law. And so my biggest question is what other contracts or decisions are being made by your board only based on the decision of with people who agree with you? Sir, I don't, uh, we make decisions all the time, but not in the case of uh, trying to represent the board. And it's not a question whether or not that, uh, that we would have ever got a fair ruling from uh, uh, Attorney General Griffin or the governor based on the fact that they had already made their decision on how to rule on our, on our behalf. So as the leader of that board, the chairman of that board, how do you build back trust with the accountability that you say you have with us today? What's your plan to build back trust with us? How can we trust you? I think my 25 years of service proves that, that I've always worked with this, each governor I've served and, and the legislators that's been here. Um, I think that's how. Senator Hester, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Magnus. You, you mentioned earlier that when uh, you went into executive session to talk about uh, Secretary Perfuri, um, you knew because it would have been a prolonged issue uh, with the board. Um, when you're going to an executive session to talk about something you'd pre-planned to do, you give notice of that. Did you give notice that you're going into executive session, and did you give notice you were going to talk about Secretary Perfuri? We have always been told we didn't have to give a person's name that only had to go into executive session for a personnel matter, which we did. And you gave notice you were going into executive session? Absolutely. Do you have minutes from that executive session that you could provide this legislature as uh, law requires? Well, we, it's our understanding, we don't take minutes of executive session inside the executive session, that that is uh, Point of order, Mr. Chairman. What, how's that relevant to this contract? I mean, we're talking about Secretary Perfuri and them going into executive session, but I don't understand where the, that ties into the... the it, it, it ties in pretty easy. They fired him and hired a lawyer to do it. Uh, and I'm just trying to understand, like in that lawyer, this money is defending against FOIA violations, repeated constant uh, FOIA violations. That's what this contract is going to be used to defend. And I would like to uh, understand exactly what those are. Sir, in our understanding of the four year of the executive session, we never violated uh, executive session requirements or the uh, benefits of an executive session. And uh, I will contend that that's the case. We always notified what we were going into the executive session for personal reasons. We've never had uh, in my 25 years, any documentation of what uh, was said in a executive session. I think it, I always thought it was against the law to take notes or to even discuss behind what was discussed behind closed doors. Uh, we always came out, followed the law to say that we're not taking any action right now and make that as a motion. I can't tell you whether every executive session was uh, on the agenda. There may very well have been, a, we seen a need as a board to suspend the rules like I've seen here today, suspend the rules and take up an item, one being executive session. Okay. So I, I can't say every executive session was on the agenda. Thank you. Uh, 
Mr. Brown, you mentioned that you were involved in an executive session, I think, on uh, January 31st. Can you, can you tell me why you were in that executive session? What was asked of you? When I submitted a memo to the board uh, laying out that I think we violated procurement law and the recommendations to fix it, the board asked me to explain the process that I went through and which legal counsel I had consulted, uh, specifically if I had been talking to the AG's office. Uh, my answer was no. I was using our internal chief counsel as discussion, and that's what it was about. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator. Representative, Cav Representative Cavanaugh, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm over here. Thank you. I just want to make sure I, um, I, one question I didn't ask was that you do receive state funds, correct? Of course, yes, ma'am. We do not have our own funding source. Okay. I right. just want to make sure because that's really what's going to determine if you're under procurement law and you do accept state money. The other question I have is if you don't understand the procurement law that we, we've done through transformation, which was five years ago or something like that, how many other contracts have you gone around and not done through the procurement process? I'd answer that question, but we've, uh, we usually get advice and counsel on determination of procurement because they bring, bring us uh, RFQs or contracts, and then the board either takes it up or, or approves it or not. I guess in this particular case, it was just unusual, and we did not follow the proper procurement law. Was it unusual in the fact that you didn't want to follow procurement law? Because it's very obvious that you knew what procurement law was because you just answered it that you knew what to do on the other contracts. No, ma'am. Uh, that's not exactly uh, the case. The case was hiring an attorney. I had never been involved in a, a contract of procurement law to hire representation for the board. The procurement law when it comes to hiring an attorney, says you can hire an attorney, but you have to follow the procurement laws, which if you had looked at the law, is pretty simple to understand. So I guess I'm kind of baffled. Something similar to Senator Dismang said is that you could understand procurement law and other things, but when it comes to something this important, you couldn't understand it. I mean, my under, I just don't understand how that's possible when we can understand it when we want to, but other times when it's a touchy situation, we don't understand it. No, ma'am. It's, it's that um, when we were confronted with this issue, the, the law, if you would have known now where we're at, that uh, Statute 702 says we have to go through the Attorney General and the governor to find an outside counsel. Once we did hire an attorney, did go to court, we were found to be under Statute 711, which says we do not have to go through the governor and the uh, AGs to get represented. So, and it says we can. I understand it may be still that you had to have procurement law to even do it under 711 but we did not know that. And so I've said it before, and I say it again, under this situation, we made an error. And there's no question about it, and that's why we're here. I, I, I just have, I guess, a little heartburn saying that y'all did know procurement law when you have it at your fingertips to know procurement law. Thank you. Senator Gilmore, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So. I want to circle back with um, Senator Dismang's line of questioning real quick, and then I have another question to follow that. With the line of questioning talking about the sovereign immunity, so what you're, the gist of what we're doing here today, you're asking us to approve, to ratify whatever the terminology is, a contract that would waive sovereign immunity, which would be in some cases a violation of the Constitution. And I see heads shaking, but that's what you're asking because that's what's said in this. So we can shake our head no if we want to, but that's what is being asked of us. Yes or no, is that what you're, is that what you're asking us to do? Yes or no? Simple question. I didn't shake my head no. Are you talking I, to I me? wasn't referring to you. Okay. 
My answer would be no. Thank you. Mr. Brown? No, that is not my intent. Great. So I guess then my other questions is, when we look at this and we, we hear some of the discussions, I, I guess my question, I, I don't know, Mr. Brown, if this is for you or maybe it's, I think it's really for the board. Was there not an email sent to Mr. Colbert who works for the board? Does Mr. Colbert work for the board? Mr. Magnus, Mr. Brown, Mr. Byers, who wants to answer that question? He is a compliance attorney. He's not, he's not necessarily a board attorney. Uh, and yes, I believe there was an email sent to him, um, but uh, it was not sent to the board. But he was, it was sent to your compliance attorney? It was sent to the compliance attorney. And, and do, you, do you know what that email stated? No, sir. So you just agreed that there was an email? Uh, yes, I, yes, I was told that there was an email from the Attorney General's office about the, uh, the process of uh, securing outside counsel. But I'm, I, I don't know. I, I never saw the email. Okay, so there wasn't any curiosity as to read that email to, to see if he was trying to it, somehow comply with the, the orders of the judge, which, by the way, are on appeal. They'll go to the Supreme Court. We'll get that worked through. But there was testimony a second ago that, that y'all didn't trust him to even comply, and he didn't, he didn't try to comply with that order, but yet you just testified he did try to comply with an email to Mr. Colbert. Is that not correct? Uh, he did send an email to Mr. Thank Colbert. You. Thank you. Speaker Shepard, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to go back to the sovereign immunity issue. And actually, um, th th since this issue has just come up with this, with this document we were just provided, and I'm not even sure that, to be quite honest, I'm not sure how much the gentleman in front of us, I'm not sure that this was intentional or unintentional on this point. But the, the question I have is, we, to follow up on Senator Dismay, I think we need to know who asked for that change. It's obviously a change to the standard terms of the services agreement. And somebody asked for it. And then secondly, who inputted it to this? Because that would also help to tell us who asked for that. And the reason why I say I'm not sure if anybody here intentionally or unintentionally knew about this is it does not, this does, that does not benefit the state of Arkansas, nor does it really benefit the Board of Corrections. Because it's not, an, it's not an affirmative statement that everybody agrees sovereign immunity doesn't apply. It looks pretty innocuous on its face, if applicable. But what it appears to be setting up is the ability for the attorney, if he's not paid, to not only, right now with sovereign immunity in place, you would come through the claims commission and, get, and that comes back to the legislature. But if sovereign immunity, if somehow sovereign immunity didn't apply, which it probably, it should apply. I think the court is, the Supreme Court has been very broad in the application of sovereign immunity. But this appears to be uh, just kind of a caveat here to say, well, we don't want anything in writing to say where, where either side is affirmatively confirmed sovereign immunity. So guess what? If the attorney doesn't get paid, it would appear that he can go into court and ask for ask sue the board of corrections or whoever to, to attempt to receive payment. And what he's concerned, what is, and who knows? That goes back to my questions: why we need to know that because this that term that those provisions don't benefit the state. They don't even benefit the, really the Board of Corrections, and it further illustrates, to get back to the original questions about who all was consulted, because I would imagine there are plenty of attorneys in the state of Arkansas that would have never asked for that provision, that they would have understood that to deal with the state of Arkansas that sovereign immunity applies. And so I would like for those questions to be answered, because I think that it's very important uh, related to not just to the, whether we review this contract, but just in terms of going forward. Because, again, this, I don't see that this is beneficial to anybody that's sitting in this room today. And so I, that's what I would ask. Who asked for it? Who made that change? And uh, I think that that's something that would be uh, very important for us to be able to understand. I'd also like to know, I guess, from the standpoint of was this, did anybody at the department or the board review this? 
I mean, this is, this is a contract with an attorney. So that attorney can advise the board about a contract with, with, them, with themselves, right? So did somebody, was there, were there attorneys at the, at the board or at the department that were engaged and reviewing this on behalf of the board? I, I can say I do not believe our board compliance attorney did it. Or I don't know if Mr. Hodge that was up the table a while ago did it. I don't, uh, I can't tell you who, who filled the form out. We will find out who put that in there and get back to the uh, Chairman Flippo and Mr. Jane. Uh, we'll, we'll get back to both chairs. Do you have, does the board or does the division or department have a chief procurement officer? Yes, sir. Her name is Ms. Heather Bailey. Would she be the one that submitted this contract that, that I was talking about earlier, that one that said? I would have to ask her on who has access to that. Is she here? To yes, sir. Can we have her come up and talk to us about this? Good afternoon. If you would just introduce yourself for the record, please. I'm Heather Bailey, Chief Procurement Officer for the Department of Corrections. Can you shed any light on the question that Speaker Shepard just asked? I do not have access to the portal, so I did not enter it. Um, one of the team members from the Department of Corrections Procurement team in Pine Bluff entered it. So you have no idea who put that part, sovereign immunity, in, in that particular contract? Um, none of body on our staff did, because when, when it was sent over, it was a blank document except for very specific pieces, and so we, we're still trying to track that down. So you don't know who filled any of it out? I filled out most of it, but not that section that's been in question. And that nobody added, knows anybody that, was that filled it out. added after it was sent for signatures. Say that again. It was added after you sent it for signatures, so yes, it had sir. signatures on it, and no. then that was added. When it left my when when it left our office to go for signatures, none of that information was on there. Okay, Representative Beatty, you're recognized. Just had a couple of things to go back and circle back on for clarity. Um, specifically clarity on the February 5th um, letter from uh, Chief Financial Officer Chad Brown. Um, Mr. Brown, paragraph three of your letter uh, states that um, the board believes it's a constitutional board. My question is, what does that mean? Well, sir, I'd have to bring our legal back up here. I was looking at it from the procurement side since it's paid for with state funds. Well, then that would lead me to think um, in your letter you believe that you're exempt from procurement. And your letter suggests that you think this is just a way that you can make payment. Is that what you were trying to communicate in this letter? No, sir, it was not. What I was trying to communicate in the letter is that even though the board under Judge James' order says they had the ability to hire outside counsel, they still should have followed procurement law and that they are not exempt from state procurement law. That was my intent of the memo. And then just a quick follow-up for Chairman Magnus. In your testimony, you stated that um, you didn't know about procurement law. But then later in your testimony, you said prior to transformation, you were... I mean, led us to believe you're highly informed on procurement law and that y'all handle things in-house. Um, my question is, what have you learned about procurement law through today? As I stated before, uh, before transformation and after transformation, we, re we rely on our procurement people to make sure we handle things, contracts, and therefore uh, correctly and follow the guidelines of procurement law. Um, but again, in this case, we did not. And uh, I have uh, nothing to say but because of the timing and what was going on. We, we And there is a little bit of the fact that I can't remember what. We've even tried to find the case, but many years ago, we hired uh, counsel, outside counsel, and... and it, uh, I don't recall going through the AG's office to do it, but that's all I, it, that's, 
it's probably a, a poor excuse because I can't remember the case. We've even looked for it. It happens. But my memory, that's what serves me uh, in that. But we require on our experts in procurement law and uh, to keep us uh, correctly. If you've been to any of our board members, that question is answered from time to time. This meet the procurement laws or are we uh, okay with this uh, contract or whatever. So they're the ones that keep us out of the ditch and most generally do a good job. And last question, Mr. Chairman, last time you'll hear me ask a question. You also stated that, that during the time period where the judge had, had ordered for, you know, communication between you and Attorney, uh, Attorney General Griffin, that you, you had no communication from Griffin. My question is, communication's a two-way street. During that same time period, how many times did you reach out to Attorney General Griffin or his office or to the governor's office to try to discuss and resolve some of the issues that y'all had? Well, sir, I, I did not. I, uh, the, the ruling was that Judge Fox ruled that um, that Attorney General Griffin would reach out to myself, not necessarily to anyone else, not to Mark Covert, to compliance sir, to myself or board members to try to work this out. He did not uh, make any contact with me, and uh, uh, there was only one day that I wouldn't have been available during that time. I was, um, I've been uh, struggling with some medical issues so I've been pretty handy by the phone, you know, uh, but that, uh, during that one day of surgery, I, I wasn't available. So for 29 days, he could have gotten a hold of me, and he didn't. In fact, um, not to throw arrows or knives or anything at the Attorney General, I mean, he had time to file a motion on Sunday before the Monday with Judge Fox asking for more time, and uh, but still hadn't reached out to get me, and I was in Little Rock. So if I so if I'm understanding you, there was no attempt from you or the board to none, reach out none, to on, the Attorney General. Not on my part, no, sir. Thank you, sir. Senator Payton, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm over here to your left. Um, so. I, I was on the, a board, and we all every time we had a board meeting, we had an attorney, a staff attorney that was there that attended the meeting. You've been on the board for 25 years. Has it been your practice that you always had a staff attorney there? Our compliance attorney was there at all times. Every board member that I can board meeting that I can remember. Okay, so the compliance attorney was there in the meeting where you decided to enter into a contract with this other attorney yes I'm sure he was there I, I, did he not I, give you any advice as to procurement law or whether or not you had the authority to enter into that contract uh, mr. Colbert testified in the uh, trial of judge Fox's and uh, he was an affirmative that we should have hired an attorney and and that was his remarks whether he said that to myself or any other board member prior to that, I, that's when he testified in court, that's when I heard it. Okay. Well, but I can remember. Okay. So looking at this contract that, that we've been supplied here, and the, it shows the part about the sovereign immunity that I would join my colleagues in being very concerned about. But in Section 2, I mean, it sure looks to me like it, this was definitely filled out by an attorney. Because I threw a line in there that says, by signing this document, neither the Board of Corrections nor the contractor admit that the procurement process advanced by the Department of Corrections is correct or applicable, and they retain and reserve all defenses relating to the applicable process. So I'm glad y'all sat there today and subjected yourself to procurement law and, and said that you believe it is applicable. But the very document that you would ask us to ratify says that it may not be correct or applicable and that you retain the, and reserve the defenses relating to whether it's applicable. Now that, I mean, that sure doesn't sound like a 
a clerk or some somebody in the procurement office uh, filled that out. That sounds to me like an attorney put that in there. As I've said before, the Board of Corrections, myself, will find out who put that in that document. Well, and I think we've got a pretty good idea because uh, the lady to your left, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. She testified that it, that, that uh, sovereign immunity part was added after it left her hands and went for signatures. There's only two people that signed it, and that's you and Abton Metazadigan, the attorney. He very so, well may have done it after I signed it. Placed and, it in there. So do you have any inkling as to whether or not he done that? or? Sir, I just now heard that Afton's signature was on it. Okay. Would he have, and ma'am, I forgot your name, but please, if you could, would that attorney who is, who is the contractor in this contract have had access to whoever on your side would have been inputting this, this information? Yes, sir. I mean, once it left my hands and it went to him for signature, he could have done it. Well, I'm not talking about the part that was added now. I'm talking about something that's in the body in section two. I haven't seen, I need, I just now found out about that part, so I will look into it. Okay. Well, I think it's ironic that you would have a compliance attorney that couldn't advise you on complying with procurement law. And I would think that after 25 years on the board, you'd know the importance of asking the attorney, what should we do at this point? The only reference I remember uh, talking to Mark Colbert was is that he felt like we needed to hire an outside attorney because he's not, he was not, he's a compliance attorney, he's not a litigator, and he wasn't a uh, employment law attorney, and that we needed to hire someone. So I think I heard you mention that in the executive meeting, you made the comment that we might need legal advice. No, I, I did not say that. I, I said in that um, executive session, that was at one of the very ends of the, one of the executive sessions, and I, th I think that came from Mr. Watson. Okay, so somebody says you might need legal advice, mm -hmm. and you already have an attorney working for you. Seems like the first thing you do would be to ask that attorney. Who, does, who determined you needed a different attorney? I think that Mark, our compliance attorney, said we would need somebody above his skills, that he was not, um, this was not in his field, and he did not want to serve in that capacity. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, Senator Irvin, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you all for being here. Um, my question is actually for Mr. Armstrong. If he could come back to the table, please. And. Um, First, thank y'all for being here. Thank you uh, for your years of service as well. Um, my question, Mr. Armstrong, is the portal and how that works. I'm not a trial attorney. I'm here to review contracts and understand how the contracts are submitted and how they're written, and that's my job as a legislator. If you look at the way this is submitted, there's more than one areas of this where it looks to me, is this computer generated and then printed out and then typed in sections because there are parts of it that are hand struck by hand. So for example, on page three, under number seven, it says this provision shall not be construed to abridge any other right of termination. The, and it's, it is with a line that's by hand agency and on top of it, it says Board of Constructions, I mean Board of Corrections. And then later on in the document, if you look on page five, well on page four, what you pointed out under section nine, there's a line drawn by hand, then if applicable is um, added, it looks like by typewriter or by computer. My qu and then again, page five, D, outstanding invoices in line for payment, it seems to be added. Number 15, it said, if applicable, is also added under number 15. Also under 12B on page five, if applicable, is also added in that section. Um, 
And I believe there is a hand correction somewhere else. So my question to you is, um, how, how are these submitted and given to us if it's through a portal? Because you said up here, under procurement method, emergency exempt from law was something that was a drop-down box so that nobody could fill that in. So my question is, how did this get, I mean, so did somebody just enter this into the portal and then print it out and then change it and then submit it to you or to the legislature? So how would that work? I mean, how would that happen? There's two parts that I understand to that question and picking up on what we heard from Ms. Heather Bailey, Apparently, the document had been prepared using our standard form and then was presented to Mr. Magnus for his signature. Is that correct? Yes. And at your time, that was the only signature? Yes. And then it was sent off to Mr. Abton? I didn't send it to Mr. Abton. I, I, it would have come from Chad or Sherry or the, our attorney so our uh, at, administrator. At that point, somebody would have had a paper document with our standard terms and the signature of Mr. Magnus. Okay. And somebody would have had to have manipulated that document after the state representative had signed it to make these changes and then send it back to the Department of Corrections where Miss Bailey, without having read those terms, because we just heard from her, she was not aware of those changes, she probably presumed that since he sent it off for signatures that somebody had just signed it and did not review it. Um, okay. okay. That's, that's what it sounds like happened. And so then it got submitted... Perhaps they're un, in, under her understanding that she had just gotten signatures. Okay. But instead, what we got put into the portal was this document, which is substantially different. And I was not aware of that, like I say, until today. Uh, there is another law that comes into play here that, if I had been aware of at the time, uh, would have referenced also on the cover letter. That is under 1911-219. We have a statute in the procurement law that says that the attorney general is the attorney for the state procurement director and to advise with respect to all contracts, but it allows state attorneys sure. to, uh, and it requires by rule, state attorneys to review any contract where our standard terms have been altered. Uh, and it requires certification by that attorney that they have reviewed the terms and find that it still stands, you know, so, so passes muster. So even if it's muster. altered, that there's a, there is a law that says... We require right a review. If so, if somebody's right going to alter review. our standard terms, then our law requires review by a state attorney. It can be okay. the AG, but it can also be, let's say, a department. Uh, okay, state so, attorney. so the changes were made outside of the portal. It's what it sounds like. It was made outside of the normal process. Okay. Uh, and after somebody on had the state signed. side had already signed it. Okay, so thank you. That was my first question. My second question is, if we are just, here we are right now, if this contract does not get ratified, then what? Because you're in the middle, correct? There's an appeal. I've kind of tracked this through the newspaper. So then what happens? What happens if this does not get ratified today? I need to know that. Senator, is that a question for me? Um, for well, for you, it could be a question for you. Would they have the ability to go back, submit an RFQ, et cetera? So if this is not reviewed and this item doesn't get the legislative review that it needs, uh, then I think there's a question as to whether or not they can proceed and have any expectation of payment. Uh, they could try to go back and cure and do a procurement process from the beginning. Uh, maybe the attorney who feels that he's owed money at this point could try to make a claim under some claims legal commission. theory at the claims commission. Right. Yes, I understand. That's, that's out. I mean, I, I share the same concern that has been expressed by Speaker Shepard and Senator Disming because that's, that was my, my main question. That's As their only I. avenue to get paid. Um, and so there's a, you know, clearly if the claims commission is, um, not going to pay them, then I guess, they don't get paid and because of the sovereignty that we have as a state. But what to the Board of Corrections would be, if this doesn't get ratified, then what do y'all do? What, what are you going to do or what, 
what's your plan because you are currently in the middle of an appeal, but the appeal was brought by uh, the Attorney General, is that correct? Or what my, happens? My, what happens next? If this doesn't get ratified and this legislature says no to this contract, then what? It's my information that, uh, that Judge Fox's rulings has been uh, appealed, but Judge James has not. I don't know if that's correct. That's my understanding. All I can say is uh, if it doesn't get reviewed and approved today, then we will be talking to the attorney and see if he wants to carry on. You'll be talking to, okay, the current attorney? Yes. Okay. Um, do you have other legal representation, though, at that point? Would then the AG's office have to represent you? No. I don't, I don't think that attorney. the AG's office can go and fight an appeal and, uh, and support an appeal at the same time. I mean, that's one of... Well, I'm, I, I understand. Judge James's rulings was you can't, I mean, you can't, the Attorney General represents us in other lawsuits, of course, that when we get sued by certain people, then he turned around and sued us, and you can't be suing your own client, per se. That, you know, all this, uh, Speaker Shepard, I mean, I... I you know, I'm not an attorney, but that was some of the remarks in the courtroom. You can't, you can't be suing your own client. I don't know. I mean, right. I don't know how you would get a vigorous, I should have said vigorous instead of biased, vigorous defense based on when someone's making comments that you're, Anyway, you're not adequate enough to carry on. No, I, I understand. I understand the conflict that exists. I'm just trying to look at the law mm -hmm. and how the law then would predicate, because I think by law they would still have to represent you somehow, some way. I'm not sure, but that's, that's what I'm trying to understand, what our job is here today. If this does not get ratified, then what happens uh, with, with what you're – what you're pursuing or what you're defending as an entity. And you may not be able to answer that question, I, I, but I, I think I it's just a I fair question. I can't give question. an answer since... Right. It's just a fair question, I think, yeah. for us to know because of what action here is taken or not taken. And, and I have questions about that, and I'm, maybe y'all do too, and so I think that's just trying to wrap this up to a conclusion here because I think we've spent a lot of time on this, and I'm, again, not litigating this. I'm just trying to do my job as a legislator in understanding this contract. This contract, as it's presented today, I don't think there's any way it can get ratified because of the way it's been manipulated. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And so I think you just have to scrap. This has to be scrapped, and something's going to have to go forward because I have to... I, we rely on our experts, and Mr. Armstrong is our expert, and the law is very clear. But, you know, that jumps out to me, but all the different areas jump out to me as being incredibly problematic. Well, I'm going to uh, speak out of turn. I don't like to speak for the rest of the board as, as chairman. Uh, sometimes I guess I have to, but I'm going to refer to what Senator Dismayne a while ago said. We should re withdraw it, find out some answers, come back and redo it. If that's acceptable to this body, that's what we'd like to do. Speaker Mr. Chair, you recognized. Speaker Shepard, you're recognized. So, well, I, I, I hear that Chairman Magnus is asking to withdraw it. I would like to ask a, a few questions, and then I'd like to confer with staff as far as the status goes if it is withdrawn. But um, to, with regard to Senator Irvin's uh, questions, which that's, that was uh, what I wanted to ask about as well, related to how this form is generated. And so this is, 
this is created through the state procurement system. Is that correct? Is that what I just heard Mr. Armstrong state? Um, at Armstrong Office of State Procurement, uh, yes, Mr. Shepard, that is a form that is available for agencies to use. It is still a manual process where they will input into these fields these different words. And then what appears to have happened here, as noted by Senator Irvin, is that the, if you look at the type face, the font, it is different. And somebody appears to have superimposed their own language above the, the terms that are pre-prepared. So is can you do that in the procurement system or do you have to generate the document and then maybe save as a PDF or type over it, save as a PDF, create a text box, or can you actually go into our system and make those changes? What we typically do in the course of a procurement, a solicitation where the Office of State Procurement is involved is we would make the changes in those provisions where they can be negotiated, but there's a back and forth exchange between attorneys, and then the document can be changed to reflect those terms. Um, and so it wouldn't appear as, as here where somebody has written something over or handwritten anything. Uh, okay, so in order to the changes here that include the if applicable, it looks like there was there's also the amendment process. It states it adds if applicable to the, even the fact of bringing amendments back to ALC. So it appears this was added after the document was generated. Yes, and then uh, I've received clarification too from Mr. Paul Ford, who's been with the Office of State Procurement for many years and is familiar with the system. And he clarified too that the emergency exempt from law is not an option available on the portal menu, and it was typed in a free form text field on the document that was attached okay. to the portal entry. Okay, so this is generated by someone at the department or the board as part of the procurement process then the document was generated for signatures. Is that correct? That's my understanding. Okay, and then uh, it appears Mr. Magnus signed it. Were these changes made at the time you signed it? I would have assumed that at the time that uh, I was asked for my signature by, uh, did you add, or did Sherry add? Sherry. Sherry, our, our assistant, that I, that Chad or somebody at the agency had filled it out. I didn't probably read it in compl uh, completely and signed it. And look, Sherry have it, and she probably is the one that got it to uh, Mr. Madagazin. Okay. I don't know that. Well, and, and, I'm, and if the chair would give me just a little, little bit of leeway. So, Mr. Brown, were, th were these changes part of the contract as generated through the procurement system? Not from, not from the department. Okay, so what? I guess I'm asking kind of for the chain of custody as to what happened. There's a document that is generated by the procurement system. The testimony here is that those changes were not made in the procurement system. Was the document signed first by Mr. Magnus and then sent to the attorney, or was it sent to the attorney for his signature and then sent back to the to the board? To my recollection, it was sent to Mr. Magnus first. And uh, then through. sent and then sent to the attorney for his signature. Correct. Is that what happened? Uh, to my recollection, yes, sir. Okay. And so, the, the attorney's signature is found on this agreement, but based on what y'all are telling us, there are terms here that have been changed, and nobody knows who changed them. Did were there any changes discussed between the department, the board, and the attorney to the standard provisions? I'm not no, trying to beat a dead horse. Again, yeah. coming back to my statement, I don't know if it's if these are intentionally included or unintentionally, but it reveals, I think, a concern that everybody can see here uh, with regard to a form agreement uh, that changes were made, and and among leadership here, no one can say, yes, we agreed to those changes and made them on behalf of the department and the board. If I may speak, um, what I've heard here today concerns me as, as a board member. I, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, again, I'm not an attorney, so I don't, I don't understand a lot of those terms. But the explanation that I've heard here today is concerning to me. 
I, I, I don't think that that's, that's the way that I operate. And I really don't think that's the way the board operates. Something, is, something has gone on. It, with this committee's uh, indulgence, uh, what I would recommend, now I'm, I'm just one board member, but what I would recommend is we pull this back and we run an investigation on, on exactly what happened. I don't mind reporting back to this committee what, what our findings are and then resubmit um, a form that is, uh, is uh, that everybody agrees to that this, this is the form that should be uh, submitted. This this concerns me. What 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 I've heard here today. Well, and, and again, uh, it is concerning to me. And of course, we didn't have the benefit of of this well in advance, so we're kind of reviewing it on the fly here. But I am concerned uh, from the standpoint of uh, these changes that were made, for which the state potentially uh, and the board, for that matter. Uh, has signed this. So uh, I guess my final, I've, I've asked for some information uh, related to who made these changes, who reviewed it. Anything that can be provided in that regard I think would be helpful uh, for us. Um, but just to be clear, in terms of, there's a number of things. Senator Irvin went through those. There are a number of changes that are made to this, to this uh, standard agreement I mean, beyond what you can insert to the standard pre-printed language. Um, just to be clear, to the knowledge of the individual seated at the table, was any of that discussed with any attorney, for that matter, whether it be for the board or the attorney that was being contracted with, as to these are changes that have been requested and we are affirmatively agreeing to make those changes in order to... Uh, enter into this agreement? No, sir. No, sir. Mr. Brown? No, sir. When did y'all become aware of these changes to the standard language? Today. I, I, I've not seen the, the contract. Uh, so I, just from the discussion today. Understand. Thank you. Mr. Magnus, were you going I've, to... I've seen the contract. I don't remember the form y'all are talking about or the wording. It very well could be. I, you know, I, I, I know that y'all say that it's been signed by me, but I don't remember if this is the full document and I reviewed it and missed that point or because I, I didn't, did not remember seeing the uh, attorney's signature on it. I could be wrong. But that's why we have to try to find out. Did I review it, sign it, or okay it to be signed, and then and then it got changed later, or I dismissed it? Well, and, and uh, I certainly appreciate that. One final question uh, with regard to the attachments, and this may be for Mr. Uh, Armstrong. With regard to these attachments, are any of these attachments standard attachments? And have there been attachments that have been added? So there are some standard attachments, and then there's some very atypical attachments. As I referenced earlier, there is in this objective scope and performance paragraph two, there's a form uh, that there there's a text box that permits people to define the objective scope and performance, and there is a reference made there to basically it's a legal argument contained in a contract and then that legal argument I think ends up getting also represented and additional information that references these attachments in paragraph five department's payment obligations it says contractor shall be reimbursed all expenses incurred in the representation uh, payment shall be due within 10 days from receipt of an invoice and then also uh, it, it adds language saying that it's retroactive to the December 22nd engagement of the January 2024 order of Judge Patricia James, and those are incorporated by reference. So we have an attachment that's a court order that somehow becomes incorporated into a contract. And now I point out that this is a court order that's still subject to uh, appeal. Uh, so 
we are binding ourselves to apparently, arguably, a ruling of a lower court that might get changed on appeal, but as a matter of contract, we are incorporating that order. Uh, I, I think it sounds like from the testimony I've heard today, I could not, if it came to me with your review, couldn't ratify it because I don't even know if there's a contract. It doesn't sound like there was a meeting of the minds. Well, and, and final question, this, this goes to the, to the department or to the board, and I, I would ask each of you individually, but I, I, based on what you've said to this point, I, I don't expect that you could recall which attachments were there at the time, but I would ask the board to look to determine what attachments were present at the time it was uh, signed or generated by the board. Were there additional attachments that were added to it after the fact? I think that that's also because attachments to the contract apparently are, are they're trying to be kind of uh, bootstrapped into the contract itself. And so we've asked a lot of questions about adding a word or two, but the fact is that there may be pages of, of purported terms to this agreement that may not have been there at the time they were signed. Maybe they were. I don't know, and I, I, you know, nobody apparently knows at this point, but would like for uh, y'all to look at that uh, to provide information as to what was actually attached at the time of signing. Yes, sir. Thank, th thank you. All right, members, we have still a few uh, folks in the queue. So several of these folks have not asked questions. I don't want to keep being a dead horse. So if you do have a question, uh, make it as succinct as possible. Senator Gilmore, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I plan to be very succinct. Uh, so I, I guess what we're trying to figure out through this line of questioning is who altered this document, and I think we'll probably figure that out. Um, I, I, I want to hear from the opinion of the gentleman at the table, board members. First of all, was there a board vote to execute this contract? With the attorney? This, this contract in question today, you have a copy, I believe, at the table now. Dated. This here? Yep. No. Was there a vote no. to, to execute that? No. Okay. No. Um, so what authority is given to execute that document? I would take it on my own as chairman to probably try to execute that and ask Mr. Brown to get it filled out for us, put it in front of procurement law. Um, so th the fact that the board approved the contract with the attorney, that I would assume that... Which was a which, separate separate contract. A separate contract, out. yes, sir. I'm, okay. I'm, but I just assume from that that we need to follow our procurement law to continue on. Fair fair enough. But my point is you approved a entire, an entirely different agreement than this one today. And this one before us today did not have a board vote to ratify to bring here. No, sir, not that I recall. Okay. Uh, again, I'll call on Mr. Byers as well to make sure. He, since he, he, he's shaking his head in the negative, so okay. I will take that as an answer. Okay. Um, so that being said, I mean, when you find the person who altered this document that bears your signature and Mr. Metazotigan, what what is your intent? What do you intend to do as the uh, purportedly the, the head of corrections based on all the, you know, statements that y'all have made that y'all are in charge of the Department of Corrections? What do you intend to do? What investigation do you tend to launch? Who, who do you trust <laughs> at this point to even get to the bottom of who altered this document? We will, I, I think it's pretty obvious. First call would be to Mr. Madagazanian. I don't re pronounce the name correctly. I'll but yeah. Yeah, uh, per, uh, to see if he changed the document. If he didn't, we'll turn one of our investigators at the Board of Corrections to find out who... Uh, I want to make sure this legislative body understands that this may have been given to me to review, and I didn't catch the stuff about the... Um, uh, the sovereignty of the state or something like that. I don't remember... When it having anything like that, I do, do not remember the attorney's uh, signature on it, but that doesn't mean I didn't have it. Well, in, in it, fairness to you, I'm I, not accusing you or anyone else, but I think it's very clear who altered this document. Well, sir, I just said that it could have been made out this way when I reviewed it 
Yeah, and, and, and I'm not accusing you, Mr. And, Magnus. And Please understand I, I, that. I would have not questioned it to a large degree because of, um, I thought Mr. Brown was handling this part of it, and I wouldn't have questioned it to a large degree. But I didn't even, I don't, I didn't know that Mr. Madagazalan had to even sign it or why he would sign it, so I can't, that's another thing about, about his signature I can't. I can't uh, answer. I just don't want to mislead this body in any way. No, I, I'm, I, and I appreciate your comments. And again, I'm not accusing you of having altered this document, um, but it, it has been altered. Um, and no, it, so. it may have been altered, but not after my signature is what I'm trying to say to you. It may have been filled out that way, and I didn't catch the fact of the insolvency or something like that. I want to make sure and understand that I was, I'm not an attorney, number one, but number two, I didn't, I thought Mr. Brown was handling it for us to turn in to this body and to procurement. I didn't know, or I don't know that I was told or not told that the attorney had any say so or got involved in it anyway. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll yield to other members. All right, Senator Dismayne. All right, and just real quick, because I, I don't think this is going to be a, uh, a big elaborate investigation to figure out what's happened. You're going to have an email that went out from y'all that's either going to have someone's signature, it's not going to have some, someone's signature. It's going to be very, very easy to kind of track down. I mean, I think you've been, unfortunately, uh, Chairman Maddox, I think you've been taken for a ride, and the state of Arkansas has been taken for a ride by someone that decided they were going to manipulate some documents before or after your signature. There is no way that anyone would reasonably think that this is an appropriate contract to bring before this committee. Fortunately, uh, yeah, <laughs> To our, our folks on in, in procurement, they were able to catch it kind of last minute and presented it to us. So we were all weren't taking for a ride. Uh, I hope that means whoever this is will be held accountable for the changes, whether it be internal or external or, or whatever may happen. I just have I do have one question. I want to make sure I understand. Were it did any other board members review this contract before it was submitted? Anyone? Mr. I mean, you, you've alluded to that Mr. Watson's an attorney. He was involved in the hiring and that sort of thing. Did he? in any way review this contract before or after your signature, you know? Not that I know of, sir. So not that, there, there not is that he mentioned to me or that I have any emails to that extent yeah. or texts. And all of this is going to be subject to FOIA. There's nothing that's in this contract that's shielded from public, you know, viewing or light or whatever. So yes. all of that information, all that transactions back and forth of reviews, maybe there's negotiations that happened on this contract, that is all going to be brought to light. I mean, it doesn't have a choice but to be because it's all information that's going to be and should be made available to the public. So again, it, but we do not believe any other board members reviewed this contract before it was submitted to the portal. Not that I know of. Okay, and I, and I apologize because I do think that you've been taken advantage of in this situation. You were trusting to someone that submitted a document that, again, was not in the best interest of state, and I don't want you to think that we believe that you did that intentionally, I just think that you've been taken advantage of. Yeah. Representative Wardlaw, you recognize? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna take a little bit of latitude as Chair of Council for a minute. So, it, and membership, if you would follow me for a second. I think it's prudent for you to pull it down. I think that was a good request you made a while ago. Um, it really bothers me with all these changes in here. It bothers me about the portal not allowing you to label it as ratification versus an RFQ when an RFQ wasn't done. And by the way, I can talk now. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you a couple questions, get an honest answer from the board, which I know I'll get. And then I'd like to see you pull it down and bring it back at a later date. The chairs have asked if we could have a meeting in between now and the, in the fiscal session, we'll work on that. I, I don't, I don't know if if that can be done yet, but uh, Senator Rice and I will work with the chairs of review to figure that out before Friday, so the proper motion can be made for that to take place. But my question is, there's been a lot of talk about who made these changes, this document. What I want to know is if you find out your outside counsel made these changes, altered this document in any way, 
without advising you that he's altered this document or they altered this document, will they still be your outside counsel after that information is found out? Your answer, from my respect, I want to talk to him first to make sure that it wasn't in there before I signed it or after. Um, we're in the middle of an appeal to the United States, I mean, excuse me, the Arkansas State Supreme Court. Uh, that would have to be a decision made by the full board uh, to to, uh, to terminate his employment for the board. Y'all have to turn off another mic for that to work. <clears throat> I can't say. I, I, I'd want to know. I'd, I'd want to look. I, I'd want an investigation into it first before I said I'd, I'd make this determination uh, based on, uh, you know, based on the evidence that I have right now. I, I, I'd, I'd really like an investigation. So I'm going to speak for Jeff for a moment, but I appreciate that type of answer that you and Mr. Magnus just gave. I think those are proper answers, and I think they are to be a board decision. And I think you ought to do the investigation. But I would expect by the time you come back here for this review, for this ratification, that you can 100% answer these questions of who made these altars and what was done to pre prevent that from happening again. I've personally been involved with you guys with the uh, private prison deal in Bradley County and worked through contracts in and out. And it's been a nightmare to get a contract in and out of legal from both the county services and y'all. I just don't understand why this wasn't a nightmare and this wasn't found out, and that's concerning to me. And I know there's been some changes over there in the legal department, and maybe those things need to be looked at. But I don't see you depending on a financial guy to review a contract. You've got a whole legal department. So that's concerning to me as well. So with that, Mr. Chair, I think it's proper uh, to let them pull it down if that's their request and bring it back fixed, but bring it back with the answers this committee has asked today and be able to stand up there and, and accurately tell this committee what's going on with this contract. All right, members, we're going to wrap it up. I have two members. One has not asked a question, and one has asked one question, so I'm going to give them an opportunity But before we leave. Uh, it says... Wrong one. Yeah, you're off. <laughs> says Senator Hammer, but I don't believe that's Senator Hammer. Okay, Senator Stone, you're recognized. Um, Mr. Magnus, in regards to this contract, with the altercations being made, has a fraud been committed? No, sir, I, I do not believe so. And the reason is he does represent us, and um, yes, it's his money we're trying to get, but I can see him putting something in the contract. Uh, so that in, inserting something in the contract without your knowledge, that wouldn't constitute fraud? He's He is done other documents for us and um, sent them off. But I don't, my problem with that is continually saying maybe it's Can't fraud or maybe we didn't give permission. It could have been in there and I did not notice it. I keep saying that, that it could have been in the document. If anybody's at fault it, uh, with that document is Myself, but you're not bringing it back to the board. Did your office to originally write the uh, write the document? Do what, sir? Did your office, or, or did you originally, or did you or your people originally write the document? I did not write the document. No. Who did? It's and so if if anybody changed it after it left your hands, would that constitute fraud? Yes, you, can you come to the table, please? Um, I do not know the law about that, and so I don't feel comfortable answering that question. So you don't think in your opinion, that if you sent a document out and it was altered without your knowledge and then executed, that wouldn't constitute fraud? I know what I think, but I don't what do feel you like think? I feel... I I'm don't, asking for I'm your not going to agree with the contract being changed without my knowledge. Okay, thank you. Senator 
Senator Payton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I assume I know the answer to this question, but I, I feel like I have to ask it. Is Mr. Metazadigan here? Can we get him to the table? I don't, I have not seen him here, no. Uh, so he's supposed to be representing you, but he didn't come here to hear, to even just be an audience member on a contract pertaining to his own business? Again, I don't see him here. Do you have any other legal representation here for the board? No, except Mr. Hodge. Mr. Hodge. Mr. Here. Hodge. What's his position? Okay. He's attorney for the uh, secretarial uh, corrections office. Okay. Did he have any participation in this, in this drafting or executing this contract? Uh, Wade Hodge, Chief of Staff and Chief Counsel for the Department, uh, and the, the answer is no, sir, I did not participate in that. Okay. So you can't speak to the chain of possession or anything like that? I cannot. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, I requested if we have another meeting pertaining to this that, that we uh, invite Lawyer Metazadigan so we can question him. Yes, sir, Senator. Thank you for that. Thank you. Representative, we got two left, Representative Kavanaugh, and then I'm coming to Speaker Shepard, and that'll be the end of it. Representative Thank Kavanaugh, you, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question really is to what your normal procedure is. Is it your normal procedure to sign contracts first and then send it to the vendor? Is that your normal procedure? After review, I've signed a lot of contracts and sent them to our, either the vendor or to a staff member or to a board staff, yes. So why would we sign and, and go ahead and execute a contract, send it to a vendor or anyone else for their signature, and then they could make changes to it? The process and all the years of my doing business is if I do a contract, I send it to them for their signature first, then I review it when it comes back to me. If it's good, I sign it and send them an executed copy. If I'm signing a contract with a manufacturer, they do the same thing. They have me sign it first and then they execute it. Your process is exactly backwards from what it should be. If it had been done properly, you could have caught some of this if you're saying you didn't know about it beforehand. So I guess I'm going to ask y'all to look at your process because your process is flawed. The execution should be the reverse way it is. And then my other question is going to be, and if staff can get, can get this from uh, Mr. Armstrong, that would be great. In the system where we enter all the contract data information, it should be handled by user ID and password so we know who's in there. So I'd like a time log of who was in this record and at what time they were in there, I'd like to complete time log so I can see who accessed this record. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Kavanaugh. We'll make sure to get that for you. Speaker Shepard, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just to echo uh, Representative Wardlaw's comments, um, I would be agreeable uh, to allowing the board to pull down the contract. What, what I would ask is that uh, the, the board has indicated that you're going to undertake an investigation and uh, given the fact that we're uh, maybe willing to allow the leeway to withdraw the contract, I would like the board's commitment to share all information related to that investigation with uh, the bureau and with this committee uh, because it is relevant. This is these are documents that were pr produced and were presented for the committee's review, and uh, so I would like that commitment from the board uh, to not just report back not just to answer those questions, but to the, with regard to the investigation itself, that that information would be freely shared with the Bureau and this committee. I, I can't speak on behalf of the board. I will tell you that I would be, I would personally be in favor of that and I would, I would push that with the board. I also think that I agree with what Mr. Byer said, but I think him being, I know he's gonna say a volunteering for a lot of stuff, but I think since he's the secretary of the uh, of the board, he ought to run the investigation and still the chairman because I'm a part of that investigation when I signed it and when I didn't sign it. And um, before or after, it was 
change. Now, the, like I said again, the board, um, I can't say I didn't see that document, and it had it already been filled out. That may be the end of the investigation. I signed it after the attorney did, no. after it was in there. I, I would have been trusting our staff to have it correctly filled out, and that's all I can keep saying. Well, and I understand the kind of the what you've stated. Uh, by the same token, y'all have asked on behalf of the board to withdraw the contract for the yeah. time being, and therefore, Please. as a term of that withdrawal, uh, I would like the agreement that that investigation will be fully shared because, quite honestly, uh, we could conduct our own investigation, but I'm, I'm not really interested in, in that. I'm fine with the board looking into it, but I would like that commitment to cooperation and to freely sharing that information. I want to re say I think that uh, since my signature's on that document, I think it's more proper for uh, Mr. Byers as secretary okay. of the board to do that investigation. And I'm sure. And I've heard that he's committed. And, and, he's committed to that and, I would and agreeable be, to that. Yes, I would be uh, fully in favor of sharing that, uh, being open and, and transparent with anything that is found. Thank you very much, and thank you for your uh, being forthright with us today in terms of these answers. All right. Senator Irvin just has a clarification. I believe you're recognized. Thank you, and I appreciate that. But it's not just the Board of Corrections. It's the Department of Corrections because this should have been through a legal attorney should have reviewed this contract. Mr. Brown, your name is on this. You are the person that's department representative with knowledge of this project, that's you with your name here. Even though your signature's not on it, you're responsible for this document, as is Ms. Johnson, um, who is the one submitting and tracking this contract. So the review needs to be both. I mean, it needs to be Board of Corrections, but it also needs to be the Department of Corrections and the failure here because legally that should have been reviewed beyond just a chief financial officer. So that would be my request. All right, thank you, Senator. Um, Mr. Magnus, as chairman of the board, are you going to go ahead and officially say you're going to pull this down? Uh, the, uh, our request today be pulled down to be brought back after we do a proper investigation right. and bring it back to the answers and a proper contract. Okay, so you'll bring back the investigation and, and I've had have members also ask if it's possible to have this attorney that you've hired Yes. Uh, present when you present the investigation findings. Yes. Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you for coming t uh, down today. One more thing we have to do, members, is uh, item E5, in-state contracts. Ms. Kathy. Mr. Chairman, we have in-state contracts uh, starting on page 35, 2 for the Department of C Commerce for marketing, uh, number 3, the Department of Commerce, uh, number 4 is Department of Community Corrections for reentry services, number 5, Health Department, uh, for janitorial services, number six, DHS for specialized rehab, seven, DHS. Number eight is uh, just changing the performance indicators and rates on uh, residential treatment. Number nine on page 39 is uh, adoption summaries. Number 10, comprehensive residential tree treatment. Number 11, the DHS beneficiary relations and net contracts. Uh, the next one, number 12, the last one for DHS for uh, inspections. Number 13 is the Veterinary uh, Veterans Affairs, and this is for temporary nursing. They have two, 13 and 14. Number 15, you have, uh, Arkansas for the um, uh, commencement ceremonies and adding the Heartland Challenge. Uh, U of A for hazardous disposal services, um, U of A for a project that they're working on for a graduate school, number 18, interpreter services for UA Pulaski Tech, 19 through 30 are all for UALR, they're for those regional prevention providers, 31 for UALR is for 24-hour uh, monitoring and security services, and number 32 is the contract for UCA with their US ABLE. Uh, this is for dental claims, administrative services, and this is the one that had the accounting error that Mr. Um, Armstrong had pointed out in his letter, but he had approved. So those are all the in-state contracts. All right, members, you've heard a description of these items. Any questions? Seeing none, without objection, these items stand reviewed.
call it anything else is reports, so we're uh, good. Yeah, uh, the only thing left is reports. Those are uh, in your packet. Seeing no other business, we are adjourned. <laughs>